The beauty of any of the generative AI tools is the strength is the creator who comes to the table. You come with your experience, your capabilities, and the things that are the words that you use to describe something, your personality imbues itself on the things that you create. And these days when I'm watching YouTube videos, sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, I think this is an AI voice generator because humans can still pick up a little nuance change. Like they read that a little funny. So this is my son. I basically replaced him with this character. This is Photoshop beta. It started with an image I just grabbed off of Pexels, selecting areas and having it replace what's there. You know, you could throw some words together and then watch it, you know, come alive. What's up, beautiful people? In this episode, we're going to talk to Brian Sykes. He's got a deep history with AI. He's got a lot of different tools he wants to share with you. And here's the really cool part I didn't know about Brian, but he's an industry veteran. He's been working in design, branding, and advertising for over 19 years. He hit a major roadblock during COVID, lost a lot of his client business, and had to pivot. And you might find like, hey, does that story sound familiar to you? And instead of sitting there saying, woe is me, he started diving into AI. I know it's super controversial. Let's put that aside. My job as an educator is to help you learn about as many cool people as I can find and what they're doing so that you can figure out if this is right for you or not. Brian's going to give us a broad overview of a lot of different tools for writing, for image generation, for text to video, for audio, for music. And then he's going to show us some real life, real world examples of how he's using AI. So you're going to definitely want to stick around for this episode. Brian, please introduce yourself. Tell them a little bit about who you are and what you've done. Hey, Chris, thanks again for inviting me on the show. I started my own business in 1999 called Ad Journey. Ran it for 23 and a half years. COVID hit and I made a pivot. And in the pivot, uh, two things started. One is I launched Headspace Branding to focus on just the part of design I love, uh, made the most impact. And at the same time, I jumped into generative AI. Being a longtime teacher, I decided to daily teach generative AI to other creatives uh, so starting on September 1st, every single day since, I've been teaching you guys how to utilize these tools. COVID happened, and in the midst of COVID, when business had diminished down to where I lost 80% of my receivables in a year, I'm like, okay, I'm in a safe place financially, but this gives me a chance to kind of step back and figure out where I want to go and what I want to do next. And I initially thought of jumping into just creating a, a branding agency, focusing just in that, because I love that aspect. But what I decided to do is about the same time I saw AI and really was blown away with what was possible. So I jumped in and as I was doing those early iterations of, of exploration, you were at the same time sharing some of those early posts that you were doing with Midjourney and some of the others. Uh, so this became a real exciting space to kind of watch you know, you could throw some words together and then watch it, you know, come alive. I spent a, a couple of months just playing in that space and I, I realized there's nobody out there really focused on telling other people how to do this stuff. So I decided I wanted to go ahead and just basically give it away. I wanted to every day create a small lesson that says, here's how this works and share uh, the creative process behind uh, working with Mid Journey, Dolly, Stable Diffusion, all the other generative AI that was out there. So there wasn't anything out there that I could find that taught you know, the fundamentals of how to even work in this creative space. And so I wrote and produced and released my first book, AI Explorer, Prop Fundamentals. In January, I released my second book, AI Explorer, Tips, Tricks, and Rules to Break. Then I started a collaboration series with other creatives because I'm seeing all these creatives who are out there and they're dabbling in this space, but most of them were not uh, positioned in a way to kind of capitalize on what they knew. And I wanted to help get them more exposure. Uh, so just sharing what they're doing on LinkedIn, but then having a book that they could kind of put their name on was something of value. But these were a lot of fun because what I was trying to do is I realized that the beauty of any of the generative AI tools is the strength is the creator who comes to the table. You come with your experience, your capabilities, and the things that are the words that you use to describe something, uh, your personality imbues itself on the things that you create. And then AI Explorer, snack size props and $5 words. Uh, this was something that Big Al Gruswitz and I had kind of played around with for months uh, <laughs> before the collaboration books ever hit. We found that there were certain words that had a little more pop, a little more pizzazz inside of Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. And it necessarily, didn't necessarily make sense as to why they did, but you could actually put these words in and see, you know, explosions happen almost and in, in what it was creating. The way I've structured this is I'm going to do an introduction, just hit some of the high level applications that are worth paying attention to. And I'm catering this really to 
uh, creative, since that's the group of people that I relate to the most from my background. All of these tools I do not use on a daily basis. Several of them I've used pretty regularly. And so I'll kind of walk through that. And then at the end of this whole thing, we'll kind of jump in and I'll walk through some iteration of how to use this practically. So first is introduction to generative AI. First case is going to be generative AI for images. Okay, the first platform is Midjourney. Definitely gets the most attention when it comes to what you can do visually. Uh, this is an image set that I recently created. The limiting factor of Midjourney currently is that it requires Discord to run on. The powers that be are looking to take this to the web. I think maybe by the time they release version six, not sure, uh, but like that's the talks. And so this is a really cool tool and definitely the place I think everybody who's a creative needs to jump in and get their feet wet in this space. This is such a powerful tool. Uh, what's possible here is just remarkable. Um, I could spend hours just talking about mid-journey because I do it every day. This is something I think everybody can really enjoy. Next is this latest release of SDXL 1.0. This is St Stability AI, and this is their latest version of St Stable Diffusion. They've actually included or put a copy onto the Discord server. So you can go in and sign up and get access to Stability or SDXL 1.0. The quality of these images are way beyond where Stable Diffusion was very recently. Uh, so this is definitely worth paying attention to. This is the reason I think they've moved into the Discord is the same reason Midjourney was there originally. It's a training ground. They can use it to teach their, their application to get smarter and better, produce better. When it's sitting on everybody else's computers and they can't see the results, then they have no idea what's possible or what's being created and what people really like. This is a great way to kind of leverage that. Next is Leonardo AI. This is a tool that's kind of come up from behind and surprised everybody with the quality that it's producing. You can see from the image, I'm using the exact same prompt in all of these, and the quality of what's being produced is, is quite remarkable. What's also neat inside of here is it has a variety of images. You can choose one to eight images in one render set, which is different from the, all the other platforms. You've also got some different uh, functionality that you can control in relation to adding a negative prompt, which is similar to Stable Diffusion. Uh, this is actually built on a Stable Diffusion backend but the quality and the training of these images is pretty phenomenal. Lexica is a an application that started doing some really cool stuff early. Their style is more illustrative. Uh, it's a simplified, it's not as refined and polished and photo quality, but the what you can produce here is still pretty impressive. Uh, so this is kind of a fun little application if you're looking for inspiration on the, the illustration side. Now, those were image generation that's basically put in a text, you get a result. There's a lot more. Um, but I want to show you a few applications that are still in the image set, but works a little bit different. So this is Pixel Cut. Pixel Cut's a really interesting application. You can bring in, like you see this image here is um, a bag. Looks like a bag of coffee. It says Audubon. It's got Starbucks on it, wildflowers. This is from a, a presentation I did a while back when I was doing unlikely mashups and brand collaborations. And so with this, I brought this image into Photoshop. I knocked out the background and I dropped it into Pixel Cut. The cool thing about Pixel Cut is you can import any kind of image and where it says scenes, you can select, it's got a drop down, and you can choose dozens of different options. And when you do generate photo, it creates four immediate images with the product against that background in that setting. Uh, this was really quite impressive. The quality is really good. Uh, this image, I could take this image, bring it into Adobe Photoshop beta, uh, fill in around the image, and I've got it, an image pretty much mock up ready for uh, social media posting. Adobe Firefly. Adobe is running behind on the quality of the images they're generating in platform, but I don't throw them out yet. Uh, the reason is because of what they're doing with Adobe Photoshop uh, with the beta version, what they're doing in Illustrator, what they're doing with text to image uh, or text to thoughts. And so there's a lot of functionality that's going to happen here that's really fascinating. So the exact same prompt you see, the quality doesn't look anything like what you saw in the other things. But I wanted to bring this in here to show you and kind of get people to pay attention to this. This is worth kind of watching because we're going to start seeing some advancement take place in the Adobe Firefly space. This is, I believe, more of their training ground that's going to be used to implement inside of uh, Photoshop beta. There are also text effects, which are pretty interesting. The one thing that it's good to note for creatives is image not for commercial use is applied to everything that you generate inside of D Adobe Firefly. Adobe Photoshop beta. When you use it as a text image, your quality is kind of low. And so this is just a straight up blank screen. I dropped in the same prompt and this is what it creates. You'll notice the similarity between this 
and what we saw in Adobe Firefly. Um, they're working on the same engine, same kind of formatting, and uh, just not that impressive. But you are familiar with what's possible with Adobe Photoshop beta when you bring in an outside image and it has a reference point that you're trying to create from. And I'll show you some of that a little later. Here is the example of the Photoshop beta and how this thing can work. So this is me kind of playing around. I'm putting in fast motion. What's fascinating here is for those who are just listening, uh, we start off with my dog in the water. Uh, he's an old guy. He's about 13 years old. Uh, and I'm totally building images around him using the Photoshop beta. It's able to quickly generate based off of the things that I'm, I'm giving it. And as a creative, anybody who can use Photoshop, this becomes a really fast way to kind of create resources that you'll need. So where it started with just a tall uh, portrait style version of my dog in a lake, uh, I've added to it a person fishing. I've added a couple fish. Uh, there was a floating basketball in here and I put some, some geese up in the air. And all of these things are happening with Photoshop beta. It actually generated a background uh, to expand the lake's view and we end up with a finished image. So just quick, fast, but it's kind of fun to play around with. Now, there's still some discrepancy or some issues with quality. You'll see in the geese, they kind of look a little off. Um, the details are the colorings off. You'll have to play with it, but this is just, I want to do a five minute fast render just to see what I could do quickly. Uh, so it's a really neat tool for what's possible. Okay. Dolly 2. I've included this in the list, but it's my least favorite of all the applications currently, but I cannot throw it out. And the reason I can't is because OpenAI is the ones who created this tool. For a company that creates something as powerful as uh, ChatGPT, I still think there's a lot of a lot of possibility happening in the uh, DALI side. Plus, they were the first to really commercially come out with a text -to image platform. This was kind of exciting when it first came out, but it was quickly surpassed by Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. Uh, but again, I don't count them out. They do still have some cool features uh, called outpainting. The image inside of this is my monster image I started with from Midjourney, dropped it into Dolly. All the exterior of this image was outpainted with Dolly. Photoshop could have done this faster simply because I could draw a mask and say, you know, create. But this is a functionality that's still possible with Dolly. And you'll notice the quality in seeing it is not near as good as the original image. Generative AI for vo voice and audio. So working in the podcasting and video realm, this is some really interesting tools. The sound quality from the first versus what you can do with Adobe Podcast is significant. Right now, this is free. Uh, you have up to an hour uh, max duration that you can upload to, and it refines the, the sound quality significantly. It removed all the hum, all the buzz, all the background noise, and it sounds like I'm speaking directly into a microphone while in a professional setting. Uh, it's really quite impressive what's possible. Okay, so this is 11 Labs. This is by far my favorite. Um, I love what you can do in 11 Labs. And so in 11 Labs, you can do speech synthesis. The Jabberwocky video that I did on YouTube that is using the 11 Labs voice. It's got the proper cadence and rhythm of a human speaker. So the sound quality is so rich. Plus you can train 11 Labs on your own voice. Uh, and then what it reproduces is quite significant. It still has some inflection issues. When we get excited, we can express a little, little faster, a little higher pitch. Uh, 11 Labs doesn't do that. Uh, but I've got a good friend who creates podcast uh, training with YouTube and he does his intro and his outro personally. And then he has 11 labs read his, his copy for the middle. And you can't tell where one begins and ends. The reason he does that is because it allows him to give that strong emphasis at the beginning and the end. That's you know, got so much personality and vibrance to it. But it slows down and goes to a normal cadence when it's reading through the script. Brian, have you used this to train it on your own voice and compared and tested to see if I people can tell the difference? I have not played with it to see what other people can think. I'll have to definitely give other people a try uh, to listen. So I'll do, I can send some samples of what I can do there. And, and uh, you can see if you can tell the difference between my natural voice and what, what, uh, what the 11 labs can produce. Have you done anything with 11 labs? I have not, but I have friends who've taken my voice uh, and just showed me what, what's possible. And it's pretty close. And these days when I'm watching YouTube videos, sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, I think this is an AI voice generator because humans can still pick up a little nuance change. Like they read that a little funny. And if right. you keep hearing that same funny pronunciation, it's like their English is perfect. There's something off about this. Right. I think it's something a lot of creators are doing today. They're using AI generated scripts about very news kind of topical stuff. And then they're using 
something like 11 lives to generate the voiceover. They're just cutting these videos and getting hundreds of thousands of views. Right. I, I think that's definitely what's the case. And you can definitely hear uh, nuanced things, especially talking about generative AI. Uh, it doesn't quite know what to do with the AI unless you separate it out. So there's a lot of things you'll have to do. This is where Murph is a, a similar platform where you kind of have to go in and fine tune. Uh, there's ways that you can basically say, pay attention to this, but you have to separate it out so you can hear uh, what it's creating because our natural language, uh, we don't have to think about it. We just do it. <laughs> uh, when a, a application is reading our voice or in our voice, uh, it does, doesn't always catch all the right inflections and things. So, but Murph is another that's pretty decent. It doesn't come close to what 11 labs can do in my opinion. The only ones that's of value are the paid account versions. They give you 10 minutes free. Uh, they use poor quality renders. Uh, the paid version, it's decent voices, but it's it's not what 11 Labs produces. Speechify, another similar, uh, very similar setting. This is something if you want something fast and easy. 11 Labs, Murph, and Speechify, that's about the order I would put them in. Price points, decent for those who are entry level and trying to find something. So there's that's the nice thing with AI is there's so many options for people to kind of jump into. Descript. Uh, this is another uh, tool for editing things. This is another one that you can train your voice on. It does a pretty good job. Uh, this was one of the first ones that came out. The thing is, is Descript didn't start off as a voice creator. The whole idea behind this was you misspoke on something and it could train on your voice and replace that word. That's kind of the idea behind it. Um, so it's not refined to be a full speech analysis. It doesn't have all the cadence, but if you're just doing this for basic word replacement, it's not bad. By the time you did something like this, this would be more for if you have an assistant that's editing your podcast, they could take something like this and fix those individual words. For me doing something, I just rather record myself and replace the word. Newbert, it's another application uh, for editing. Here's kind of interesting is this is not for speech and language. This is for music. Uh, so Newbert generates audio and the quality of, is really not bad. So this is the first place I've seen generated uh, AI music that's that sounds pretty decent, that's got a good flow and a cadence. You can match to different rhythms. You can choose tracks. If there is a YouTube video that's got a background track that you like, you can send it the link. So there's a search by reference and it can go to that link, listen, and then it'll create brand new music based off the sound that it heard off of that YouTube channel. So there's some neat functionality built into this. Some other platforms I listed are Soundful, Ava, Beatbot, Beethoven. Generative AI in music is up and coming, but this is sort of like where Midjourney, uh, Stable Diffusion, Dolly, and everything was a year ago. It's coming, but it's it's kind of early. Are you aware of the the track that that uh, some people have released that is like in the style of Drake and Kanye, and and they release a whole album and it's getting a lot of fanfare? Are they using one of these tools or something else? There's other tools out there that can be used to train for uh, creation of music. It's a similar setting uh, where it's voice trained, but you're training it based around uh, a few different dynamics. So like you can sing into this and you can train it around your singing voice, what your range is, what your pitch is. Uh, that's what they're kind of doing for Drake. And, and there's several of the artists that have really taken off in this space because their voice is being taken. There's a, a TikTok that I've been following where I think it's called I Messed It Up For You. <laughs> uh, he takes songs and he has them redone with a, a different voice, like one's Johnny Cash re-singing some modern rendition songs. And it's really kind of hilarious to look at. But it's it's a different platform. I really haven't spent much time playing with that. It could be something worth paying attention to though. Next is Generative AI for Video. Runway is one of those cool tools. They started off just in the image space, just like Midjourney, Dolly, Stable Diffusion. And their AI for image is decent. There's some functionality in here that, that's pretty cool. I like what it can do. But where they came around and blew everybody's minds was Generation 1 and Generation 2. Here's an example of Gen 1. With Gen 1, this is going to be a video I'll play. It started off as a video of my son who played uh, handball for the UNC handball team. The character that you see on the right, this was my son. He runs across and he throws the ball into the net. So I took the images. It's kind of a neat application for just simply replacing things. Uh, this is Gen 2. So Gen 1, you take an image and a video and you basically tell them to do something, you know, what you want it to do. With Gen 2, it comes along and it's got a couple options. The first is you can just upload an image and then it generates the video for you. In this case, it's going to be a video of panning in on this scene. 
but you can also just simply upload a description. So it can be text to, in, text to video. This is from an image I just posted this past week, uh, a mid journey with the reflections. What's neat is it moves forward and it's actually pretty decent considering it's starting from just an image. Uh, everything's grainy, pixelated, the quality is not perfect, but considering it started with just an image to create a uh, this kind of motion is not bad. Kyver is another fun application. This is one I think uh, creators could really have a lot of fun with. You've got a, a number of things to do. One is just what we saw before where you can upload an image and just kind of let it go and have some fun. So this one here, this photograph I did of Jimi Hendrix, uh, I did an impasto thick paint splatters style painting. It looks like it's done with a palette knife. I uploaded that uh, to Kyber. And I gave it a little bit of a song and I let it have just free reign to kind of play with it. So it's just a little wild, um, creative expression there. DID, this is the tool that a lot of people have been playing with where they upload uh, an image that they created inside of Midjourney, to Stable Diffusion, and they allow it to have a voice. So this is, it's very rudimentary. The quality is not perfect, but you're actually starting to get some animation, some three-dimensional three -dimensional depth with the image. Uh, and the, this is this is another one of those tools that's growing rapidly. It's kind of exciting to watch. And there's several that's come into this, this space uh, to compete. Wonder Dynamics is going to be a tool that's going to change the industry. This is produced by Wonder Studio. You can basically have any video where the character can be recognized. So this is my son. He was climbing the wall at a climbing gym. I basically selected him and replaced him with this character. This is one of their free characters. Now, what they get can't understand yet is the dynamics of the other objects in 3D space. So you'll see its feet are on top of the wall and things. But what's interesting with this is it was able to replace the original of my son and make this character follow his exact same motions. This is something that's coming along. The quality is remarkable considering this is not that old of an application. Steven Spielberg is actually on the board of directors with this company. So uh, there's some good names out there that's a part of this tool. Wow. That is a game changer because that's going to be some kind of version of mocap that doesn't require technical camera and equipment. Right. Yeah, it just keeps growing. I mean, what's possible? Here's some other other applications that are out there. Picture, Wave Video, Design.ai, Raw Shorts, Lumen5, Flex Clip. There's others, but these are the ones that are kind of up and coming and starting to make a presence for themselves. Generative AI for copy. This is where I really spend, even though I have a lot of fun with Midjourney and creating stuff in there and playing with Photoshop, this is where I have a lot of fun as a creative is in the, the AI space with chatbots. I just got to, through listening to uh, your interview or your, your engagement with show rust. Uh, he and I've had a lot of great conversations. So thank you for the introduction a while back. Uh, he's a great guy, but eh, the, the dough bot is really cool. I'm excited to see what's going to happen there. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first it's chat GPT, uh, it uses a fixed data set that's curated and pre-processed by open AI does not have direct access to the internet, but you can plug it in, basically give it access to the internet. This, to me, is by far the best platform out there currently uh, for engaging and conversing. And I'm going to show some stuff that we can do with this a little bit that creatives, uh, I think, it can revolutionize how you do your work. Next is Claude. Uh, this is the ethical rival of ChatGPT. And a lot of people, when this came out, were basically saying, this is the death of ChatGPT. It's not. Uh, it's a good platform. The quality of the what it gives and the results it produces is actually really good. I, I've been impressed. This is tied to the internet. So you're going to get a little more results that are tied to active content. How is Claude ethical? I don't know that it's... I, this, is the, this is actually kind of funny because this is what it declares of itself. So I'm not sure how it's ethical. <laughs> I just took their description of themselves okay. as an ethical rival. I see uh, I'm not quite sure how they've defined themselves that way or what makes them so, but they do consider themselves a rival of ChatGPT and they consider themselves ethical. <laughs> uh, it's a very, it was an interesting statement, uh, but I really didn't spend the time mm. to dig into it any more than that. A lot of these AI engines are built off of OpenAI's core technology. So sometimes they're using that core technology and changing it and saying, well, we're the rival. It's like, are you really? Because I can't imagine that it's that easy to create an AI engine, right? I, that's what I'm imagining. Um, there was yeah. the school, the I'm trying to remember which college it was, Stanford, I believe, that created an AI agent to rival with uh, ChatGPT, and they did it with six hundred dollars. Um, I think that was Stanford. It's possible with some people, but they're still using the the how to that was created by uh, open source platforms. It's made it available to everybody. Yeah. So it's not like they had to start from scratch. Microsoft being 
Uh, they're running off a version of ChatGPT4. This is interesting because while it's okay, it's it's got some really weird things it wants to do. And this is something I've, I've heard a lot of people complain about. Like if you're trying to get serious with ChatGPT, or excuse me, you're trying to get soft, serious with Microsoft Bing and you're asking it questions about you know deeper things or harder things. One of the things I heard just just this past week on a podcast, it said that this guy was asking you know some some questions about uh, I think it was dealing with funerals and things because his um, mother was sick or something. It goes through and it gives him some pointers of some things to be thinking about in that space, and then it says, "Would you like to draw a picture?" And he's like, "What, what the heck? <laughs> um, no, this is not the time for you know kind of." But it doesn't understand the delicacies of things. And so there's some elements in how it communicates and engages that is not as personable as what you might find with Claude or with ChatGPT. Um, and it tends to be what you see here. It, it's giving you information, but it's also sending you ads. <laughs> this is one of the pieces where I, I find Microsoft being less desirable because as you're searching and using it as a search engine, it's going to function like a search engine and use that as a place to sell ads. So I think this is one of the things that kind of discredits it in that space. Google Bard, it's impressive, but at the same time, it's a liar. It's probably the most inaccurate of the platforms that I've worked with so far. So I took my first book and I uploaded the PDF to it, gave the entire thing, and I even summarized for it what I'm, you know, what the key points are. And I said, I want you to go through my book and just kind of break it down chapter by chapter. It starts doing it, and it's fine. Once I went to the next question, it started making things up. And when I would point out your the error of what it's doing, it kind of blew me off. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And then it let me let me try it again, and it would still give me another wrong answer. Um, so Bart's got this this uh, issue with making things up as it produces content. Yeah, its hallucination factor must be turned up quite high. Yes. Yeah. For sure. These are some other AI platforms uh, for writing copy. Um, these are some you may have heard of. Jasper AI right off the top. They were one of the first ones that came out. But Closer Copy, Phrase.io, Copy AI, Writer.me, Copymatic, Simplified, AI, Writer.com, Smart Copy AI, Peppertype AI, Scalane.com, Copysmith, Write Sonic, AnyWord, Shortly AI. These are copywriting competitors with pre-chain specializations. Each of them kind of have a refined element. But what I found is I can kind of do the same thing and sometimes even better with ChatGPT. In other words, if inside of ChatGPT, I can say, I need this to sound like or write like, give it copy samples and it can reproduce just like what I'm after. I don't have to use these other platforms. This is going to be a really difficult market for these as we continue going forward with the current AI that's available in things like ChatGPT. Generative AI for logic. And this is where I think ChatGPT kind of rules the, the roost and I'm bringing it back into ChatGPT again for logic. The reason is because I can use ChatGPT to address and engage problems and creative problems. Um, this is one I'm actually going to walk through in just a second. What's another idea directed at people who do not know me to compel them to contact me and learn more? So I can give it questions and feed it information and then have it engage with me. Generative AI and creative workflows. So this is where we're gonna change gears and start engaging with using some of these tools um, and then kind of make some some progress around that space. Any questions with what we've looked at so far, Chris? No, it's been good. It's a good overview of all the different tools that you might be interested in. I'm interested in where you take this next. Okay, so this is the fun stuff. So for me, it's kind of like everything, hey, this is what's in the catalog, now let's jump in and use it. Okay, this was really hard to narrow down just a handful of use cases because I wanted to jump in and think about some primary areas where creatives could utilize these tools uh, quickly. I start with Gen AI in branding. Chris, this is probably very familiar, your core brand attributes uh, using visual words, literally taking that piece. Mm -hmm. And I did a video uh, that's the role of generative AI and branding. And I walk through this process. So somebody who wants to load this a little bit more, I've got it on my YouTube channel, but I'm gonna walk you through what I've done. I fed it information and I'm just gonna read so those who can't see are able to hear it in the podcast. I have a list of six brand attributes under which I have several direction attributes. And I describe it. Descriptions gather from a conversation with the owner of the brand. I will supply you with the brand attributes first, then give you the direction attributes for a particular brand being developed called Keep Trucking. Does this make sense so far? This is me talking with ChatGPT. And here's something that's really important. When you're engaging with ChatGPT, describe what you're giving it 
and then ask it constant questions to make sure it understands where you're going with it. Do you, you know, this is why I always follow up as does this make sense so far? Or do you understand what I'm asking for? This is very valuable because you're able to find out if it's, it's sort of like when you talk to your kids. Uh, I remember when my kids were little, you tell them something, they nod their head and they walk off and do the very thing you said, don't do. Um, this is sort of why I ask so I can get feedback and make sense. ChatGPT responds, yes, it makes sense. You will provide me with a list of brand attributes and give me the direction attributes for the brand keep trucking. This information will probably be used to develop the brand's identity, voice, positioning, and other brand related aspects. I'm ready to help you with the task. Please proceed with providing brand attributes. Okay, so this information was actually something I do with interns. Uh, I love what you and Anneli put together on this. This is fantastic. So it's easy to give to an intern and, and teach them the process of thinking through uh, creating a logo. So this was from a video I did with a friend of mine called Aaron Butner. Aaron uh, wanted to start a little side project business called Keep Trucking. And I did an hour long interview I take this hour long interview, give it to the intern and they fill in this information. And this is a great practice for them to kind of know what to look for. From the information I supply to you, this is me talking. I need to choose a set of three brand attributes with one direction attribute for each brand attribute. So I've given it culture, customer voice, feel, impact, X factor. All that information has been given to it. And now I'm telling it uh, to choose a set of three brand attributes with one direction attribute for each brand attribute from those supplied that go together in a unique and unexpected way. So select from the six brand attributes and direction attributes a set of three words or phrases that can be used to set the tone for a brand identity. This is be an easy tag on to what you guys are already producing and, and offering uh, in the brand strategy class is how to utilize ChatGPT to get the results. So the three will be the direction focus of the brand. Does this request make sense? And it responds, Absolutely, it makes sense. Summary is it gives me three. It says, here are my selections. Culture, fun. Voice, funny. X Factor fosters positive relationships. So it selected from all the options and it shows three and it found things that logically resonated with it. And then it explains why it shows those three. These three direction attributes come together to paint a picture of a brand that doesn't take itself too seriously. Hence, fun and funny, but deeply values the connections it builds with its customers. Fosters positive relationships. This could be a unique and engaging identity setting Keep Trucking apart as a brand that delivers joy and positivity through its products and interactions. This is kind of cool because we could do this, obviously. But what's nice with this is we can remove our prejudice, our assumptions, our personality, and step back and say, you find things based off of what the customer said. So it's not me driving it. It's actually you're randomly making a selection based off of what we've gotten from the customer. And then I asked it for two additional selections and it comes up with what you see in pink, gift givers looking for a niche, funny gift, high quality soaps and candles, funny, goofy. And then for the third, motivating, mood to action, a heartfelt story. And then with each of these, it explains why it chose those options. So for the pink, a go-to place for high quality, humorous gifts. For the green, motivating, mood to action, heartfelt story. It's a motivation, motivational culture that inspires action through products and carry heartfelt stories, making the brand resonate emotionally with customers. Its choice and its reasoning is actually sound and logical. I could go along with this. Next is, okay, from this set of words that I've given you, fun, fun, funny, fosters positive relationships. What I told it to do is you provided me with three great potential sets from these sets. Typically, I began putting together a collection of fonts, colors, designs, samples taken from a variety of sources. So I tell it, I want you to take those words and break it down and answer these questions. Words, why chosen, other brands that have this similar styling, the colors that you'd recommend, typography, imagery that represents this brand, and then others would be ways that you can think outside the box. Okay, so from this, I could hand this to a designer and it spells out everything that would go into the design of a mood board. You have everything kind of defined. You've got your words, you've got your color sets, you've got some examples of reference to kind of give you an idea. So this is a fast way to jump into this. So the next step would be the mood board and they can take off with it. So again, this is just utilizing ChatGPT, ask it a few questions, give it good content, and it gives you some fantastic results. Gen AI in ad concepts. I don't know if you know Tom Crispin and Paul Fix of Ad House. Uh, they're based in New York, but they created a deck of cards called Ad House of Cards, a deck for nerds. There's 35 cards, and I just took nine of those cards, and there are 35 proven techniques tried and tested at Ad House Advertising School to help crack that award-winning campaign. So these are just kind of like those momentum must busters to kind of get people moving and creatively thinking. So I fed it nine of those words. So this is actually me typing in the thing. I've given it all, nine of the examples. So you're seeing one through nine up here at the top. I'm typing in, I have a client. What I'm doing is I'm telling it that I want to have it draw from one of those nine words randomly. 
So I have a client that provides business to business solutions targeted at uh, software as a service from the card deck. What is a creative way to create an ad for this client? If I click submit. Now it's going to go from those nine selections that were programmed into it for the ad house. It says, all right, let's randomly select one of the methods from the ad house deck of cards. Let's take number card number two, time travel. Given your client provides business to business solutions for software as a service, we could take a creative approach by envisioning a world without their product looking back in history. So it lays out from here the basic thought structure behind creating an ad, but it's using a reference point. So this is a great way for creatives who are trying to problem solve. Uh, you could have uh, a deck of cards. You could have a book that you've read. You can pre-program it with thinking and ways to process and then call on it to give you the information you're looking for. So sort of like what you're doing with the Dobot, you can do this in a small version um, working with ChatGPT. In this case, nine cards, and it uses it as a reference point. So it gives me pre-product era, imagine the world without it, introduction of product, impact on history, today and beyond. And then it tells me how to kind of put it together. So the next, so this is really good now for another client that's a base layer manufacturer for the outdoor winter sport arena. Uh, I'm going to ask it to kind of do the same. What is a creative way to create an ad for this audience? And then I tell it to use the deck. And I'm going to give it its carte blanche to figure out which one of those things to use. What's interesting is you could actually just keep generating the same and it'll keep drawing from a different card and give you another idea. It chooses number six, make an enemy, and it walks through the entire process. So I identify the enemy and it begins creating all the content that goes into the thinking behind creating this ad. Identify the enemy, declare war on the issue, uh, highlight the battle. Victory is show the victorious short uh, sport person unhindered by cold or damp, enjoying their sport to the fullest. And there you go. All right, Gen AI in image edits. This is uh, using Photoshop beta, and it started with an image I just grabbed off of Pexels, just simply selecting areas and having it replace what's there. This is where it could be a huge asset to somebody who's got something simple. They could go into Photoshop and maybe do some simple refinements. So this is a way to utilize this tool to kind of speed up that process. So take me through your thought process here. You're cleaning up the wall. You added a, what is that? It's a shrub over here on the, the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, I throw some graffiti on the wall, took out the top and gave it a sky. I got a reflecting pool at the bottom. It's no real rhyme or reason. This isn't necessarily for an ad, but the idea of you've got carte blanche to just play and have fun with this tool but you can direct it to wherever you want to go. This is the, the beauty of this tool is it's wide open. I mean, from creating a shrub on the left to creating artwork on the right, replacing uh, a building with a sky, giving a reflecting pool, all these things happen quickly with the tool uh, just simply by drawing a little marquee around it and, and generating. Generative AI in ideation. I did some brand collaborations of the unlikely mashups, and this was kind of a fun series. And this actually started working with uh, ChatGPT, where I gave it uh, a list of about five different things that I thought of. And I said, this would kind of be a fun mashup, you know, if this were to happen. And based off of that, give me some ideas that are similar. And I gave it refinement of structure of what I'm looking for. It needs to have you know, these, these qualifying attributes in order for it to be a benefit. And so this is what it came up with was Adidas and Nintendo Switch, and it called it Play. And so this was kind of a fun idea. Another was the brand collaboration of the Audubon and Starbucks, where they'd use the Starbucks grounds. And this is what's kind of cool with this one, is it would define how it's recycling or how it's reusing. So in this case, it's using coffee grounds uh, with Audubon flowers, and it's packaged uh, as a way to get wildflowers out. So this was kind of a neat mashup. This one actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, generative AI in ideation is with storyboards. Uh, this is something I've done with a lot of clients in the past where in order to explain a product uh, to the sales team or explain a product to a, cl a client would be to create some simple storyboards that walk through almost comic book style. With Midjourney, you can easily create the images. I can tell the story in long form and then say, I want you to take this and divide it into 10 panels, break it down that way and it creates it rapidly. Photo shoot planning. So ideation side of things, you're gonna do a photo shoot with a Puma. It'd be kind of nice to have some ideas before you got there. <laughs> so this is kind of you know ways that you can think about what you might wanna do and how you'd wanna do it. And you can set a lot of the details up. Most of the photo shoots I've worked with in the past have been uh, catalog driven. I didn't have to worry about a Puma in the audience, but uh, this is something that's kind of a neat way to kind of play around with the ideation side. And stylized imagery. With all the tools that are available in Midjourney and all the other platforms that are generative AI, 
You can also integrate with the existing tools. You're familiar with the any of the tools. So you have the Photoshop and you've got the After Effects and Premiere. This is one that was kind of created with several tools. So there's tools out there that you can actually grab individual components of something and manipulate and create that uh, the motion that you're seeing. Then also be able to cut an image from the background, playing with it in Photoshop and um, adding in dimensions through layering stuff. And Brian, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Uh, LinkedIn is by far the best place to find me. Uh, I'm there every single day. So it's LinkedIn.com and it's Brian W. Sykes. And you're going to see me with the orange background behind my head. If they want to dig into some of the resources, some of the things you talked about, the books or training, what's the best URL to give to them? Yeah. So the BrianSykes.com is the best place to find me. That's probably the easiest one. And from there, I've got all my, all my links to everything else. Uh, also, I try to give all my links on my LinkedIn profile too. Wonderful. Brian, you've given me a page full of notes and tools to test out, and I'm so grateful that you were here. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Chris. 